Well, my name is Dan Valamis, and uh, we will wait as people um, click in to uh, enter the webinar, uh, and we'll get started here real soon. If, if you guys want to share in the chat where you're, you know, signing in from, it's always nice to see locations and whatnot. So uh, feel free to do that. And uh, I'll add that I'm And it's cool here today. It's nice. I'm sure not everybody has that. Um, all right. Well, I see that uh, I think we've got people in here. Uh, so I'm going get, to get started. My name is Dan Valamis. Uh, and we're going to talk about our favorite new features of OAC. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Louis and uh, Rivas from uh, Product Management. Thank you for joining us, being our mystery guest this time. Uh, and uh, Tim Valamis, Kathy Pendley could not make it today, uh, so uh, we're going to try and fill in and I'll cover some of the materials she was going to cover, and then I'll uh, show some things that uh, I found of most interest. Um, just so we uh, ground things, here's some helpful links. Uh, this is, by the way, what we use. This is what I use yeah. to prepare for this webinar uh, every couple months that we do this. Uh, so this is where we get all the information on uh, the analytics group, product management group, puts together a fantastic series of videos. We'll show you a little bit of that. Uh, and the this webcast, we're covering the May and July new features. We kind of took the summer off uh, at analytics and data Oracle user community. Uh, so you can see the links to the OAC May 24 features and OAC July 24 features. Uh, and then we also use the documentation that Oracle comes out with every month. By the way, there are some hidden gems in the documentation. Uh, that's where you find out some of the internals are not a big thing for everybody, but uh, there are some things and occasionally some things get desupported. So you may want to look at the uh, documentation uh, to see what's in there. Uh, this is also part of the analytics community. You can always post things on community.oracle.com products, Oracle Analytics and some libraries of examples and demos. Um, I'm actually using some of that stuff in today's demo. As I mentioned, this is in a series of webcasts uh, that we give. Uh, we have been doing the, this within the Analytics and Data Oracle user community for about five years now. And you'll find the archive of everything that we have recorded up on uh, our TechCast archive at andouc.org slash techcasts as well, we have those on our YouTube library. So if you follow the little YouTube link from our homepage, you'll find all of those available out there as well. Uh, thanks to, by the way, one of our members, Wayne Van Sluice, uh, then records these and posts them up on YouTube. So thank you to Wayne. Uh, these are some of the upcoming ones. Uh, this is where we are, our favorite features of OAC. And then Cloud World Session Analysis and Expert Agenda Recommendations. If you're going to Cloud World, and you are a follower of analytics and data, you should come and see what our panel is going to recommend in terms of various Oracle Cloud World sessions to go to. Uh, so that's taking place on September 15th. And then we have one on uh, discovering the Oracle Fusion Data Intelligence on September 19th. Also, I believe we're going to try to do another webcast uh, in mid-October uh, yeah. on the next release of OAC uh, that's coming out in September. Uh, we've seen kind of a list of some what's going to be in there. It's pretty exciting what's coming up. Yeah. So we're Dan, we're actually covering two releases today, but the September release, release is probably about as big. So yeah. there's a lot of features coming at us. It's very exciting. So It's almost as if the Oracle product management people were like, hey, we have Cloud World coming up. We want to get all those features into the cloud world release. I, I wonder yeah, if that had anything know. to do with it. Maybe. Maybe not. A little <laughs> Maybe bit. A little bit. <laughs> Hope fun at our Oracle friends. Yeah. I'll, I'll be I'll be uh, previewing two of those features by the way as well. So, so oh, oh, all right. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Lewis, for sharing that. Uh, that's great. 
Um, we always welcome our Oracle friends to share previews of stuff that's upcoming. Yep. Um, if you have your own topic that you want to talk about, we would welcome you uh, to submit that topic at andouc.org slash techcast. We would love to hear how you're using uh, Oracle technology in your project and uh, feature that in a future TechCast. There's a way to submit abstracts for that, and it goes through a review process. And we are now looking at uh, having people present in October and November, and there are slots open. We'd love to have you present. Um, this is part of, as I mentioned, a community. You can join our community into these URLs. I will put those in the chat as we go along so you can join us. The big thing is probably our website and the Slack uh, workspace on uh, joining us over there. That's where we conduct a lot of our board business and such. And then there's other channels as well. Um, I'll also plug our upcoming conference, in-person conference. You can submit your abstracts now. Uh, that's available and you can get more information on that at uh, andouc.org slash analytics and data summit 2025. Again, I'll put that link in the chat. Uh, so we'd love to see you in person out at the uh, Oracle uh, campus uh, in California, April 8 through 10, 2025. All right, so with that, we're going to jump into the topics we'll talk about today. Uh, Lewis is going to go through several things. Tim, I'll cover some of the stuff with Kathy in, uh, in my session uh, at the end. And uh, I'll also mention before we kick things off, if you have comments uh, or questions that you want to uh, address, Please put those in the Q&A widget that you see down at the bottom. We try to flag every one of those, talk about them interactively, or uh, we'll handle Q&A at the end, uh, and we can put some of those in the Q&A widget without taking time from everybody. Um, so otherwise, put where you're from in chat, and we'll talk next time. Otherwise, I'm going to turn things over to Lewis and ask you to share your screen and uh, tell us a little bit about some of the features that you're especially excited about in these past two releases of Oracle Analytics Cloud. Sounds good. Can I, you want to stop sharing again or can I just? Uh, you, can, you should be able to just start sharing directly, but I'll stop sharing. Okay. I've never used that feature before. Yeah, we still share from the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, so I want to talk about four things today. Um, a couple are going to be from the main release, and a couple are going to be previews from the September 2024 release. So the, the first couple of, of features, uh, we're going to talk about a new capability where you can uh, create data sets uh, from files that are stored in the OCI uh, object store. And uh, we've given you a, a pretty cool set of capabilities around there. Um, I'll also show you a preview, or uh, not a preview, but uh, just a brief uh, look at a new feature that you may have not even noticed. It's uh, we're we're working on maybe a little bit more um, exposure of this, but it's a it's a feature that takes the results of the the profiler and, and it allows you to fix some of the treatises that come in. And a couple of preview September 24 features, uh, which is grouping in workbooks uh, with a wizard, a uh, similar wizard that we have in the data sets and prep, and also a wizard to calculate durations uh, of dates and times. And you'll, it's probably easier to see those in, in the demo. But real quickly, in terms of an overview of the OCA object store, uh, it, it, it's gonna, it's gonna use, it, the OCI resource connections that you currently have, if you're using uh, some of the advanced uh, AI functions in, in ADW, for example, or, or some of the other uh, OCI resource uh, resources. So if you have one of those, it'll automatically start working with any buckets that you have available. Um, we've given you some robust uh, search capabilities, and I'll show you that. Uh, it's going to support just the normal files that we, we support now uh, from your local file store, which is the Excels, the CSV, TSV, and TXT files. And uh, currently, we support resource connections that use an API key. And, and the team is working on 
uh, getting the resource principal uh, type of connections to work in the future. And, and then you'll see this as part of the demo. And then on, on the on the tree nest is it's going to be a little uh, magic wand that you should see when you bring in a file or you bring in a table from a database. And as you know, we, we take a little bit of time to, to do a semantic, a deep semantic profile. Um, it's, it's going to then detect that some of the measures that came in, for example, are, are keys or, or there's something else. And, and it's going to provide a list uh, that you can review and, 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 and disagree with if you'd like. If you, you know something you want to keep as a measure, you can uncheck it from the box, hit apply, and it'll automatically change all those uh, columns uh, from measure to, uh, to attribute so that it doesn't uh, give you a, sort of a, a, a bad measure that shouldn't be a measure. So, so on to the demo. Um, here, I don't know what to do with these toggles here. Hopefully they're not showing. Um, so for the demo, it, uh, just in case you're not familiar, the OCI object store is going to use the OCI resource connection. If you don't have one, you may want to create or ask your admin to create uh, a connection for you to, your, to the OCI resources. Uh, they're going to need the tenancy ID. They're going to need the user, the OSID. And then we generate an API key, and then we create that um, API entry in OCI. And, it, and a little trick, uh, you have to sort of wait a couple of minutes when you do this, uh, because it, it just takes a couple of minutes to roll through all of the uh, regions. And then you click Save. If you click save too early, it's going to give you a little error. And that's just, it, you know, if you've done everything correctly, uh, just wait a couple of minutes and then click save and then it'll, it'll go ahead and save. So once that connection has been created, um, it will uh, start to show up um, as of the May release, it will start to show up in the create uh, data set um, set of connections. Um, and you see that there's an OCI resource connection here. Uh, if you click on it and you do have access to some uh, compartments and buckets and objects, uh, we will start with root, uh, with the root compartment and any buckets that are in root will display here. Uh, you can also navigate manually through all of the compartments if you have uh, hundreds of compartments. Uh, we also give you the ability to uh, to search, and the search is going to be wild carded. So I can just do dev, and uh, notice that it gives you anything that has a dev in it. Um, so that's uh, really handy. And I'll click on PM. That's where I want to go. PM bucket again. Now we have all of the uh, buckets under this PM uh, compartment. And again, uh, usually buckets are a little more granular. So we want to search and we click on demo and it gives us all of the buckets that have demo in it. I'll click on the bucket. And then on the right hand side, you will see the list of the objects. And again, we filter these by the allowable um, extensions. And you can have uh, obviously objects that are pseudo folders and we will display those as folders until we get to a particular file. And at that point, it just acts like a uh, file system. You click on the file that you're looking for. Uh, we will present uh, the, the preview of that, of that file. You can see if it's the file that you were looking for, you click OK, and then we treat it as uh, we would treat any, any other file. We'll go ahead and take a sample of it. We will profile it. Uh, and after the profiling is done, we will show you the data quality insights. And you can start working on, on as you would normally do. However, there are 
some really cool enhancements that come with bringing a file in from a OCI object store um, that that I'll talk about. If you want to, if you want to bring in another file from the object store, um, notice that that now we we so list that connection uh, that says object store resource connection. We um, in in the future we may support more than object store for OCI resource connection. So we're explicitly saying, you know, these are the files from the object store. Uh, and if you want to bring in more, you can, there's a little icon that shows up. You can click and it'll go and you can get another file. Um, and you just navigate to where we were uh, and you grab yourself uh, another file from the list and you can join them and so forth, just like you would. The other uh, benefit is uh, you're also able, you're going to be able to set up uh, schedule reloads. You can manually reload if you know there's an uh, updated file in that, in that same bucket, uh, or you can schedule uh, reloads just like you would with any external database uh, table, which is a, a really cool enhancement for handling uh, files as well. So um, that's the uh, OCI, uh, pretty much the, the gist of the OCI connections. Uh, I'm going to click into the data prep and show you the uh, tree dash enhancements. So here we have uh, the file and it has a lot of measures that are treated as measure. Uh, but we also have some um, couple of few IDs and, and some other things that, that shouldn't be measures. And normally we would go in and manually sort of fix these, um, but you may miss some or, or, or something. And, and uh, what we've done is we've, we've taken the results of the profiling. Profiling can detect keys, can detect, uh, in this case, uh, latitude and longitudes and, and things that um, are similar to, to, to sales figures or, uh, or, or, or some other type of numbers. But they shouldn't be measures, and 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 the system provides um, a list of the things that came in as measure, but that really should be converted to attributes. Uh, if you like the list, and we do, you can click apply, and it'll automatically create uh, the transforms. It'll automatically uh, set all of them to to attribute, and um, you very quickly kind of cleaned up your your treat as is that, which um, I, I tracked the telemetry on this, and this is kind of the highest uh, manual clicks that, that we see uh, users, uh, other than, than renaming and, and, and working on, on, work, uh, on something that, that will also allow, help you rename your columns to, to more uh, user presentable columns. So those, those are the two features that, that came in May. You already have them if you have OAC. Uh, they'll come to you if you have OAS in, in January or uh, when the uh, 2025 release comes out. Um, for the preview features of the September release, um, there's a couple. They're small, uh, but I think they're, they're really helpful in terms of doing uh, things that you may have to do uh, and, and well, so let, me, let me interject for just a moment and share that uh, in the webcast, we always like to see the preview things, but I just want to make sure people know that you can't use these today until you your OAC uh, instance is up, get upgraded to the September release. So go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are a September release. That's why yeah. I, I switched boxes to a, uh, an, early, an early adopter box. And... Um, the feature, the, the first feature that it's in, in the data set editor under the prep is the ability to uh, create durations between dates. Uh, we've done a couple of enhancements here. So you, we, if we click on ship date, uh, we've gen been generating these three new recommendations to extract age uh, based on current day. Uh, for in years, months, and days. Um, and you were able to do that manually as well. 
the enhancement here is that we actually added weeks, hours, minutes, and seconds as well. If you want to go down to that grain, and you will also notice that when you get your September release, uh, we will have a new menu item that says calculate duration. If you click on calculate duration, it'll give you a little wizard. Um, you can re you can rename this or let the system sort of automatically name it for you as you do your clicks. Um, and we say uh, relative to to another date, or you could just leave it as current time, but that, that you could do automatically with the other menu. But you can select another date in the data set. So we started with ship date. Um, we changed it to until and, and relative to order date. So what you're saying is give me the number of years between uh, from order date until uh, ship date. So the way you use this, or 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 you can change it to to since. And obviously, for ship and order date, hopefully you're not. My customers aren't waiting years, so it's going to be zero. We don't do partials. So what I really want is how many days uh, are my customers waiting between order date and ship date, and uh, then the system calculates that in in full days. And again, you can go. Uh, if, if there's a shorter um, duration, uh, you can calculate hours, you can calculate all the way down to seconds as well. But in this case, I just want to do days. I click uh, add step and notice that uh, we create the column. Uh, and here is the number of days. Obviously, the, there's a big outlier there that uh, something happened with this order. Uh, was ordered in one on January and got shipped all the way in, in April. So, you know, we've already discovered an insight that we may have missed. Uh, and we create that as a measure, integer, and it's going to be the aggregation of average. And you can change it if you, uh, if you like, we thought average was probably the most appropriate one there. And so we have had wizards in data prep uh, for for a long time. And one of the things we discovered is, hey, uh, these wizards would be really helpful uh, to workbook authors as well. Uh, they're having to sometimes for things such as what we just did here with the wizard, they're having to know and, and, and create a, a, a logical SQL expression in workbooks. And why aren't we helping those users with wizards? So, um, the first step in that journey uh, is we've added the ability to uh, create work uh, uh, groups uh, for text columns um, in, in using a wizard and instead of use, uh, having to write a complex uh, case statement. So it, imagine that we only have subcategory and we don't have these higher level ones. And, uh, sub subcategories is a little too granular for our analysis. Uh, when you right click on the column itself, you'll see in September <laughs> a, a new menu item called Create Group Calculation. And this uh, can be clicked uh, here, or if you right click on calculations, you'll see the same thing, Create Group Calculation. The only difference is if I create it here uh, generically, uh, you then have to select the, the column and we show you all of the columns that are allowed uh, to have uh, groupings. Or if you just know the column that you want to do and just right click here, it'll take you directly to that, uh, to the column and to the values for that column. And at this point, uh, this wizard may be familiar, the same, same one we have uh, in the data prep area. So the workbook author would be able to then create, and I'll just call them group one, two, three, um, and create different groupings. Uh, we can include others, and you get a preview as you're working with those. And you click Save, and now it creates a calculation, and it still places it in the uh, MyCalcs folder. Um, but it's it's if you edit it, it, it continues to be uh, wizard-driven 
calculation. It's, it, the user doesn't have to know anything about what's how that how those groups are being created, and that it, it's really uh, really cool. If you you're able to to duplicate the calculation, and it'll still continue to be driven by the by the menu. But let's say you're an advanced user and you just wanted to start that way, or somebody else started with it, and you have a list that you can actually pop in uh, faster with uh, a Vim or something. You can um, go ahead and copy the expression that's underneath this grouping calculation, create a regular expression, and you can paste it in. And you'll notice that what we've done is we have uh, done, done a lot of, um, that's a little bug, by the way, a little expression, expression, we'll take that out. But uh, we've done a lot of uh, commenting on this case statement, which is in the old days, we couldn't do this and it would like be one, uh, maybe Dan remembers, but <laughs> you couldn't, and you'd have to figure out what was going on. Uh, we've made it as easy to find out what is going on uh, with the case statement. So it's, it's very readable, uh, it's formatted. And if you notice the, the bottom gives you pretty much the, uh, the whole, what's happening here, right? It's calculation is, is grouping into four groups and, and it gives you the names of the groups and gives you the others. And um, you can then go ahead and add additional grouping uh, into this, this calculation, you name it, and it would uh, act as your new uh, grouping category. So um, this is hopefully the first of many wizards that we will be bringing in. Uh, the, the aging ones that I just showed you in data sets uh, is probably another candidate to, to soon be also able to, to be able to right click uh, on a date and, and calculate age and calculate durations between two dates and so forth. So um, I'm very excited about. Um, Do you mind a question on that? Yeah. Um, we have wanted to do this type of stuff and uh, are sometimes uh, jealous of what you can do in data prep. Uh, when you're working with a subject area, would this, by putting this in the workbook area, would this work against a subject area or does it only work against data sets? No, it'll work, work against the subject area. Any, any, okay. any calculation that you can do against the subject area uh, would, be, would be grounds for, for the same thing. So Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and we did have a question that came in that I'm gonna go ahead and ask here. For the duration feature coming in the September release, does it round up or round down? I'm guessing that's you know when you're calculating number of days uh, or something it, like it, that. Well, how does it round? It gives you, it gives you the, the 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 full. Um, I think I would say it would round. That's a great question. <laughs> Does it work the same way time, time stamp diff does? Yes, but um, it, it's it's because it's it's a black box. I don't know what it does. Ah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I'll have to get back to you. Just okay, all right, fair enough. The right answer. I think it's a it's a whole number, right? So if if you don't have a full day, it's going to give you zero. So I think it's going to round down. Okay, but I'll get back to you on that. Okay, fair enough. And so, so if you have 0.99 of a day, it's going to give you zero. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to. All right. Um, I'm sorry. I started asking questions. Are you? Uh, is that it, or do you have more to show? That that, that is it. One one more thing that I, I did want to call out. I don't see it on your uh, links there. Uh, is uh, we also do some blogs and uh, I'll occasionally, maybe once every month or every two months, I'll go ahead and blog about in, in, in very um, detailed uh, fashion about a particular feature, a particular uh, best practices. So um, this is my particular blog. I, I should have put the generic one because I my colleagues also uh, occasionally do some blogs like uh, Gabrielle, and prevent and so forth will do just some cool blocks. So it's fun to, to plug that. Great. If you could uh, put that link in the chat, Lewis, and uh, while Tim's talking, and uh, just like I 
put stuff in there while you were talking. I think that'd be yeah. great. Um, yeah. Tim, I think it's over to you. All right. Let me make sure I've shared the correct screen here. And can you guys see this? I see a sand key. You see a sand key graph. Well, excellent. That just happens to be what we're going to talk about. And um, we've had sand keys for a long time, but recently what, what they've done is they've enhanced them. And so we have a lot more control over the sand key graph. Now, sand key graphs can look complex, but what they're ideal for is showing relationships uh, with when you have a lot of attributes and showing what's related to what in, in a particular sequence. And they're also very good for flow graphs so that you can see different stages within a process and what the, you know, what's contributing and then what it's leading to. So kind of prede predecessor successor uh, type of relationships. So uh, th these are something that, that, you know, fall in the realm of kind of an advanced visualization, but we found them particularly useful for certain kinds of, of use cases. Now in this, we're, we're actually looking at uh, customers. And so, and then we're looking at where they are and their order status, and then what type of customer they are and actually what products they're they're ordering. So we're looking at customers kind of, you can think of this as starting on, you know, the um, the whole, how do we get a full 360 view of what customers are doing? Obviously this isn't a full 360, but in other words, what we want to do is look at them on multiple different types of attributes and different types of groupings. So um, with, with sand keys, the way we use these is that we get the relationship from one particular attribute to another in the sequence from top to bottom. So we're here, we're starting with region, and then we flow through order status and customer segment and product type. Now, if you're, you know, so if we look at, oh, the APAC uh, uh, customers that are billed, you know, then what segments do they belong to? And then what products are they ordering is the way we would typically use this kind of graph to uncover these relationships. Towards if we try to do this in other graphs, it, it, it could be, uh, uh, it could be pretty, we'd need several graphs or particularly in tables, it's really pretty hard to uh, to get these insights. Now, what, what is also interesting is that order is particularly important when we're using these sand keys. So for example, if I said, okay, I'm going to take order status and I really want to start with order status and then interrogate, you know, what are the, um, you know, where are they and who are they and what do they order? So this changes the graph quite a bit, not from the data that we're using, but actually from how we're visualizing it and interpreting it. Uh, the other thing you should know is, well, you know, again, here, here's our build, APAC, and we can follow it again. It's kind of a similar path. Now you can click any of these and follow it forward or back throughout the graph uh, so that you can kind of explore your data multidimensionally. You can hover and you can see, you know, how many customers there are that fit this particular uh, definition. But, um, you know, the, this is kind of the, the, the key use case in terms of what's new for sand keys. Uh, what we have now is we have the ability to either do a stretch or a condense. So if we have a can, can we come here, condense. So this is kind of what we had before in terms of how we looked at it. Um, and, you know, sometimes you like the overlapping, uh, the wide bands, sometimes you may not. I'll show you a little trick on colors here in a second. Um, but the other thing that we get, I'll do that guy. The other thing that people have, have noticed and you can you can set your node gap here 
So we can, if we do auto, I think it's at 50%. So this determines how much of a gap do we have between, between the, how much white space do we have? And you can, you know, move this up, move it down kind of thing uh, on, on no gap. Sorry, this is no gap. Custom, okay, it's set to 40. So if I go 20, you know, you're going to get much, much lower. You're going to get wider bands. And if I go 80, you're going to see that uh, they're going to be much larger. Okay. So this gives you the ability to kind of edit and, you know, play with your sand key and determine uh, what you want to do with it. The other thing that's that's uh, node height is going to change you know, this bar right here in terms of how wide, how, I'm sorry, node width is how high, do you, how wide do you want it? So you can change that. And then the line transparencies, just in terms of how much of an overlap. Let me go to this guy and just uh, show you real quick that this is the default, one of the default colors. And one of the, one of the things we do often with these sand keys is we want to highlight something and then read what are the members of it. But if you notice with these darker colors, it's a little bit harder to read, you know, with what's highlighted, what isn't, because, you know, they're, they're fairly close. So one of the things that, um, that I've been working on is using a lighter custom range of colors so that if we do highlight some of these, we can immediately see what's highlighted. And the way I did that is, oh, let me just actually just color, just show you this real quick. And so if you noticed, I used a custom uh, range here, a custom gradient. So uh, uh, this one should have been, uh, hang on. I may have grabbed the wrong example, but uh, so these three colors were used in, from Color Brewer from picking a sequential color scheme, these three colors, and uh, that gives us a better range so that we can determine, we can kind of see what the colors are in, in, our, in our sand key. Uh, one of the other, uh, do I want to continue? Yes. So... One of the other major uses sometimes is in uh, like cash flow statements. So here we have, here's our, in essence, uh, sources and uses, you know, kind of what's related to what in terms of uh, an income statement. So you can see that revenue is split into gross profit and COGS, you know, operating income, net interest income and other income contribute to pre-tax income pre-tax income contributes to net income and tax, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this is, this is nice, but if we change the, uh, the link type, and this is new in the group by, so we can actually group this by value. And now we're going to get a, a sand key that actually looks at the value and then organizes our attributes by that. So we can actually see what the flow is uh, within this particular data set. So if we're looking at a profit and loss statement, for example, and we want to see, okay, well then what are the contributors to revenue and what does revenue flow into? And then, you know, what are, what are the components of gross profit? You know, those kinds of things we can, we can look immediately and see its operating expense R and D uh, and uh, SGNA. So I find this as being very exciting, very useful, and I think well, there are all kinds of flows within an organization. So you may have employee flows in terms of who, who's being hired, who's being uh, uh, who's leaving, why are they leaving? You know, when is that happening? So we have customer flows, we have uh, inventory flows between different parts of the business and, and, and whatnot. We have uh, obviously cash flows. So there are flows all over the place. And right now it is 
pretty challenging to figure out how do we visualize these. So with the new sand key graph, I think uh, we're looking forward to using those. Um, the other thing, Dan, I wanted to cover real quick, and I know we're, uh, we may want to pause and ask if there are questions for Lewis before he has to drop. Yeah, but I just wanted to, um, I do have one thing for Lewis. I just want to make sure you hear this. Not a question, but it would be great to have parity between those data extraction features from data sets to workbooks, as well uh, as for those you, of us using RPDs and subject areas. Please fast track more if possible. I think that's not the first time you've heard that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think, uh, Metro, Dan, I think you listed a, a link to to the to the community um, yeah. and there's ideas I, I think the best um you know some of some of these things are, are outside of my area or they're they're outside of my pay range in terms of prioritizing so when we have ideas that are an idea lab and the and and we have a new a new uh, format and a new procedure for ideas and idea lab and and we've added a new idea status uh, that's, uh, uh, I think, needs votes or, or something. And we'll, we have a committee internally that will definitely look at those ideas, see how many votes they have, and then prioritize uh, our development um, accordingly. Yep. So yep. We, I'll cover the idea lab in my section, assuming Tim doesn't take all my time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and thanks, thanks for everybody for your time. And then I, I posted my blog, uh, and uh, I think you've been <laughs> there. There's contact info there if anybody has a, a question and so forth. But um, thanks, yeah. Thank you so much. All right, go ahead, Tim. So Dan, I just want to cover real quickly on parameters. You know how you can. You know here we have a typical filter drop down, and now what we have is we can. Uh, exclude something from and create a parameter. So this, if we say create parameter, just in our filter, we actually created a new parameter for exclude ship mode, okay? I had done it before. And now this parameter, if we edit this guy, what it did is it actually created a Boolean 01 so we can turn it on and off for that parameter and have it work for the whole workbook. So when we have something uh, hooked up to it, it will work. And now if I select this and I say exclude, you know, obviously it's gonna, we're, we're gonna update our, uh, and I'll click apply. It's gonna update our visualizations. And, you know, we're going to be looking at the ship modes and excluding delivery truck. The use case, we're using this right now with one of our clients where uh, it's a higher ed client and we wanted to look at who's majoring in something and how are they performing in these, what grades are they getting in certain classes, and then compare it directly with who's not a major in that, in that subject. So the example is how are the math majors doing versus the non-math majors? And so this exclude kind of parameter and being able to work with parameters more in a more rich way is really helping us. And uh, I just wanted to cover that real quick. Okay. Okay, so, Tim, Dan, are you done with that now? I'm sorry? Are you done with that now? Yeah, no, I know we're running close, so I'm going to turn it over to you. One question that came up, uh, yeah. if you can address it quickly, in the SAM key, is it currently possible to put numeric theta labels for sizes, for the sizes on the bars? Yeah. Okay. So we can add numeric, I believe that is in there now. On the bars themselves? They, so we have data labels uh, for the SAM key, and we can add them uh, on... Uh, well, that's, yeah, uh, numeric labels. Uh, do, 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 oh, that's an interesting question. That's yeah, I don't think, I don't think we have numeric labels. Yeah. It's an yeah, I'm not seeing it. Question. Sounds like something for the idea lab. All right, yes. I'm going to uh, okay. go ahead and go on to uh, my stuff. Uh, let me share. Put them above. Okay. Oh, 
Well, it's a new Zoom feature, the ability for multiple people to share at once. Hopefully, okay, I should be showing demo workbooks for narrow screens. Um, all right, so uh, one of the things I wanted to show was, uh, and this continues kind of a, uh, a strategy that I've seen a shift in Oracle Analytics. Uh, when the data visualization engine first came out, it was much more on, if you will, autopilot. And there continues to be more control that we as workbook authors now have in specifically changing things. Uh, so here is a dashboard I just grabbed from an instance uh, to be able to show stuff. And you can see what this looks like um, as I look at this um, um, at this window and then if I collapse this down uh, and I have this collapsed down, um, you can see it just shrinks it a little bit. Uh, so let me uh, just show what we, that we lost like. your it share just, Dan. Oh okay, let me uh, share it back. yep. Share it again. Okay, now you should see it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so now if we have a responsive uh, dashboard, if I now switch to that canvas, and you can control that on a canvas by canvas basis, when I shrink this down, you're going to see at a certain point, it's going to get so uh, short that the visualizations no longer make sense. And in this case, what it'll do is it actually snaps. And you can see at a certain point that instead of having three across the top, I've controlled it to where there's only two across uh, in the top. And so you can fit more in here. Indeed, in the extreme case, as I shrink that down, it would go down to only one across. And this is now under our control. I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, if I go into the edit mode, by the way, you have to kind of learn these sequence. That's as a presenter of this. If I go into edit mode, and there's this little hidden new icon down here, Responsive Canvas Editor. And you have to turn this thing on. And when you do that, your filter bar gets replaced by this little um, slider. And this allows me to set breakpoints as to how what I want to do with the various sizes. Uh, and you can see what that looks like as I shrink this guy down. Uh, or more appropriately, as I move this little slider down, you can see what it does and now it snaps. And I've set breakpoints at these specific uh, points and you can add breakpoints at what, at what pixel ratio. Indeed, this one down here is set for mobile. And when I take that slider down there, that's how I control this. And now in this area, as an editor, I can drag these canvases around and say, well, I don't, I want it to look like this and I can control how things look at different width of a screen. Uh, and that's what this responsive layout does in here. Uh, you can remove the breakpoints, manage the breakpoints, all that type of stuff in here. And it's really to try and give the design time person control over what is shown at different uh, widths of screen in pixels. Okay. Um, so that's one example. The other thing I wanted to show uh, is the ability to um, uh, control new dashboard prompt types. This is something new in uh, one of those two releases. I forget which one. Kind of doesn't make any difference anymore because uh, everybody has it. Uh, if I now come in here and go into edit mode of here, you can see now in this dashboard prompts. And by the way, if you haven't caught it, Oracle is moving towards uh, using dashboard prompts unless they're doing things on the filter bar. Uh, we've seen them improve the dashboard prompt area. I think that's because people like us have hammered on them saying, hey, you had better capabilities in the old answers uh, product and we need these features in here. So now we have new prompt types and in the old prompt, all you could do in these prompt areas was be able to have these drop downs. Now we have different filter styles. If I come in here and I can see for BU, I've set the filter type to list box, checkbox, radio box, that type of thing. I can have whether it, uh, whether it allows for multiple selections or not. And in here in area, if I drop down and find the area piece, uh, I have switched this to 
Again, the checkbox, radio box, but in this case, it is filtering and I can control how many lines it allows, whether it allows multiple select, uh, turn that on or off, uh, that type of thing. Now it changes to a radio button instead of a checkbox. Those types of things are now, they even have one in here for, uh, if I get to it over here, for payment status. This payment status is a slider between paid and done paid. Makes a lot more sense with the numeric in here, but that type of thing, you can switch these things back and forth uh, on here. So hey, all Dan, of that is available in terms of the dashboard prompts. Yeah, one quick one quick tip on using these new uh, filter view uh, objects. It, it helps to group logically, you know, which one of these prompts would be used in, in concert so that you can apply or not apply it to diff different visualizations in the canvas separately. So that's one thing that we found is that, you know, these, you know, just having one view a lot of times is, uh, uh, can be challenging where we'll just put a second one directly underneath it. We'll have two. So that's where I can put a second dashboard yeah. prompt in here, control what's there. You have a lot of flexibility in how you lay these things yes. out now. Yes. Uh, so, um, all right. More choices in how we design things. Uh, the other stuff I wanted to show, uh, I don't have a live demo on this, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what else uh, can be done. Uh, one of them is in here, there's the ability to apply conditional formatting. Uh, this is stuff that Kathy was going to talk about, kind of just slide through. And by the way, all of this is available. If I come in here in the Oracle Analytics YouTube channel, this is where I find this stuff. I go to playlists uh, under Oracle Analytics and YouTube, and this is where I see all this and new features in July. This is the playlist for the July stuff. If we come in here, I can uh, look at conditional formatting for tables. Here's all the new stuff. So conditional formatting to totals. And I just scrub ahead to see what it looks like in terms of here's the grand totals. And we now have the ability, I'm gonna just give you a sense, you can look at this when you uh, get this, uh, look at this video, but you can apply conditional formatting to the total rows as well. And if I go forward enough in the uh, video, you can see uh, where it starts applying that and all of that conditional formatting can be done in here as well. Notice the little thumbs up that appears in office supplies and such. And you can see they go through exactly how to set those things in here. Uh, so that's something else for you to uh, look up and see in here uh, as well. Uh, the idea lab is where you can vote these things up and down. So if I come in here and look at the idea lab, this is what that looks like. So if you go to this URL, you'll find that in the chat. Uh, fortunately, Becky put that in for us. Uh, you can come in here and vote on these and upvote the OAS API and see what people are liking. And if the, and you know, one of the things I know Kathy was gonna share is she has seen as a customer the things that she lobbied for and got her friends to upvote, <laughs> her features got implemented. So they do actually look at this. And I think you heard before Lewis said that, uh, yeah, they're actually uh, redesigning this because they're finding that this is very helpful for them as product management to see what the community especially wants. So take a look at that and vote for your favorite enhancement request. Um, that's what I especially had to go over uh, for today. Um, and I would welcome you all to uh, come up with your own uh, webinars, talk about that. There are a couple of new things also. Uh, one last thing, I'm, a couple of things I need to talk about. One is uh, the incremental refresh of data sets. I don't have anything to show you on that, but look for it if this is something you care about. There is the ability to now incrementally refresh your data set. You have to supply a key so it can figure out what's new. Uh, you have to supply that in some form or fashion. Look at the video on that. And also there's a the ability to share visualizations using workbook email schedules, including bursting, uh, is out there. Uh, that's in preview. You have to come in here uh, and go in and 
in the console, you have to turn on your preview feature and then you can share visual, uh, you can share those and have those burst out. There's some setup involved in uh, hooking up to an email server, all that type of stuff, but it's a very handy way of doing that. And I think that starts to uh, replace in effect the delivers features that people have been using in the classic um, feature and make the, so that data visualizations can be shared with others. Um, now, last thing I wanna ask people for is, um, if you find that this type of webinar is helpful, look at our website, uh, andouc.org. In another week or so, we'll publish the link for our upcoming webinar on the next release and go through those. Uh, register for it. We'd love, we enjoy sharing with you what this is. And if you want to be involved, let us know. We'd love to include you as well. Hey, hey Dan, yeah, the man. other thing I'd, I'd like to mention is that the release documentation does have a section on what's new for every release. And we only covered a very small portion of what is new today. And so that's why we call it our favorite features. <laughs> yes. So it's it, it happens to be what we've used recently or we're excited about or whatnot. And so just know that, you know, there there is a this product is evolving very rapidly and there's a lot coming at us. So um that so if I look at the in here, this is the uh, documentation from Oracle. There Here's what's new that's, that's... Uh, for this for July and what's new for May uh, in here. And uh, that's where you can see what's coming up and all the stuff is handled in here. So and... you can see that there are, you know, easily more than a dozen features and we only covered a couple of them. So. Yeah, yeah, we just don't have time. Well, thank everybody for joining us for the webcast and uh, we will look forward to talking to you the next time. Thanks, everyone. Yeah,